everyone and welcome to today's webinar on introduction to cable diagnostics my name is sanjay yadav and i'll be hosting this session today speaker for today's session is mr garnot paklepa who is an application and technical support for cable at mega germany also on the panelist we have mr mohammad saleh sales engineer technical at mega middle east who will be assisting for the q and a session so before handing the mic over to mr garnot i would like to highlight a few points you all are being muted to avoid any disturbance during the presentation do pack any question you may have for the q and a session at the end or share it in the q and a chat window all questions will be answered at the end of the session so i request every participants to share their questions in the q and a chat section uh, we have an exclusive middle east page on facebook and linkedin which i'll share in in the chat section so you can just follow us for regular updates we also have our upcoming webinars so i've just shared that in the chat section you can go on the link and register yourself for the upcoming webinars also there will be a small survey form at the end of the webinar so please do fill the same for the feedback regarding the webinar the recording will be sent to you within a week through the webex system and also the presentation i now hand over the control to mr garnot so let's get started over to you garnot yeah, thank you very much and welcome to all the participants. Um, I hope you can hear me well uh, and uh, Sanjay is uh, monitoring that everything is going well. Let me share my, my screen to you to get started. As I see, you should be seeing my first presentation screen. Okay, so again, uh, welcome to everybody who is here. Um, you, you might have participated already in the kind of the first um, uh, section in late April. We were talking about cable testing with a little bit deviation into cable diagnostics. And today we will practically do it the other way. And uh, I want to talk about cable diagnostics with a little bit looking back into cable testing also, because these two topics are very closely related. Um, cable testing is basically just a yes or no, um, yeah, well, a test when there is a weak spot in the cable. I don't want to talk about a cable fault, just a weak spot, um, because the fault is, is, is not here, hopefully, um, but the cable might be aged and we want to check in what condition it is. You could do this with a test, put over pressure onto the cable and either it fails or it holds um, if there is a weak spot. Okay, if the cable fails, you'll have to do the fault locating, um, but it would be nice to do also a cable diagnostic measurement, which is non-destructive, which means even if there is a weak spot in the cable, the cable will not fail during your diagnostic measurement. The nice thing is you can do put it back into operation after your diagnostic measurement. Even if you find that your cable is in bad condition, you can still use it and then judge how you want to proceed. That is one thing we will see today and we saw in testing also. A lot of things is judging the situation and that takes a bit of experience. There are standards available but it also takes some um, experience comparison. And so I know everybody is always asking and, and likes to know um, what this number tells me, what should I do? I see the result of a measurement, what am I supposed to do? And that is very difficult to, to say from a, um, well, from, from, from just a table or a number. And here it comes in like, in this case, we are like a doctor. We have an instrument which does a measurement and it gives us a value. And even if our patient has a very bad uh, uh, pulse rate or so, he is still alive, but we know what condition he's in. And then we can judge how to treat the patient. And that's the same thing with cable diagnostics. We do a measurement, we get a result, and now, we have to judge from basically from experience 
what this means and how we treat the cable. Do we repair the cable? Is there something to repair? Is there something to exchange? Should we exchange the whole cable? All these things. And an instrument cannot take this decision for us because the instrument doesn't know, is this cable important? Is it not important? Um, and uh, so the, the operator, the network operator, the cable system operator needs to judge how he wants to proceed. Maybe you have a cable that is very important. It's not so bad, but it's very important. Going to the airport or a hospital or something, then you would treat this uh, cable with preference. And a cable that goes just to a residential area, um, you don't want it to fail, but it's not so critical. But this is something that's an information the instrument cannot know, only the operator can, can know this. The nice thing is when you do several measurements, you can judge very quickly um, or you will see very quickly if one of these cables has a very different reaction than all the others. We will see there are different methods for cable diagnostics. Um, and they will give us different answers. Again, that's like with a doctor. Um, you can measure the heart rate, but that won't tell you if the patient has broken bones. So um, there are different measurements and you can do all of them. You can do just some of them and uh, we will look at what these measurements tell you. And as I said, um, after your, your diagnostic measurement, the cable can go back into service, no matter what bad condition it might be in, it can go back into service and then you can judge how to proceed. Also, that allows you to judge how much to invest next year, maybe for the budget, how to plan your budget better for next year or the coming years, how many cables need to be exchanged, how many cables are old, but they turn out to still be good, so you can use them longer. And that way that saves a lot of money. Um, and um, judge uh, joints, how, how good they are. If you have some weak spots in joints, so you could just go and repair the joints to get your network system stable, running stable again and avoid outage time. Um, also very nice thing is the joints. If you find that they have problems, you can repair them before they actually fail. So you can do that under scheduled conditions with everything um, scheduled and planned. So customer uh, customers don't see any outage, they're supplied some other way. And when you take the old, the bad joint out, you can take it to the um, to the shop, open it up, and look inside what was the problem. So you can learn from previous mistakes and improve workmanship. See if anything uh, is reproducible, and you can see, hey, there, uh, here we have to watch out um, how to improve the workmanship, and, and and already by that avoid future failures. So very nice. Um, we have here just an overview what we will talk about. Um, this was cable testing and cable diagnostics. Cable testing, we've said there's a pass or fail answer. So it's only yes or no. It blows up during your test testing time of um, maybe 15 minutes or up to one hour. We have DC test, which is only done on paper insulated cable nowadays because um, DC voltage can cause problems in plastic AC cable. So we want to avoid that. So for actually for plastic AC cables, we're using um, 0 0.1 hertz VLF, very low frequency. That's uh, nowadays, I would say, the typical, uh, typically applied test voltage for cables. There's resonance test that applies more for higher voltage cables, um, but takes a lot of big truck size instruments. 
and there's the AC 50 or 60 hertz test, that would be a very nice test if we could do that. But um, as mentioned already last April, um, I'm sure one of the um, important points is we cannot really do a 50 hertz AC test in the field because we would have to change polarity or our little test instrument would have to uh, um, change the polarity 100 times per second and charge and discharge the whole cable capacity um, 100 times per second. And the small instrument is not able to do that. This is something you can do well with resonance or um, VLF. You can, with 50 hertz or 60 hertz, you can test isolators or switch gear, um, isolating gloves or mats or whatever, um, things without capacity. But the cable has capacity. So in the field, we cannot test that with 50 hertz, not with just a simple 50 hertz transformer. We will see during our test voltages that we apply that we are using voltage shapes that come close to the 50 hertz using the resonance effect, basically. Um, this was just talking about the testing. And the testing, as you see here, is applied to the whole cable. Terminations, cable material, joints, weak spots, the, the whole system um, is under that voltage. Cable diagnostics, well, is using some high voltage also, very often the same voltage sources as the testing. That's how they're related. But we go only for certain um, parts of the cable. We will look at the tongue delta measurement. Um, there was, there is around the isothermal relaxation current and return voltage method diagnostics, but they are more like kind of like laboratory style. You can do it in the field, but it turned out that um, in the market, everybody is using now tongue delta is the um, the measurement, the typical measurement to go for cable material, as you see here. And that's very important, which we will see um, throughout the, the presentation today. Um, tongue delta is checking the cable material. It is not giving you any information about terminations, joints, or weak spots of the cable. It is looking at the aging process of the entire overall cable insulation, the main insulation. I'm not talking about the jacket, that's a little different topic, but the main insulation, that's the most interesting part for us, the most important part. Um, if the main insulation over the whole cable length is aged, in terms of um, plastic cable, that would mean uh, water trees. If you have a lot of water trees, that's the aging process of these um, plastic cables. If you have a lot of water tree affection, you get a bad tongue delta value. You don't know if there's a location with that, um, that it would be worth to just uh, repair 100 meters of cable. Um, but you know, in general, is it good or not? To tell the truth, actually, that would be a very good measurement before a very low frequency test. Doing a very low frequency test, you don't know if the cable will fail. And if it fails, it might fail in different locations, which would mean repair the cable, continue your test. It fails somewhere else, you have to repair it continue the test, it fails again somewhere else because your cable was old. And then it will fail one after the other, but you have to repair before you can continue your test and maybe find another spot. So it would be nice to do a tongue delta measurement, first of all, and see if your cable material is healthy. If it is healthy or quite healthy, giving you a good value, then you say, okay, then I will apply VLF. It does make sense to still apply VLF test voltage and not simply say, well, my tongue delta said the insulation is good. 
So why should I test it? Insulation is good, it says. Well, if there is one weak spot, let's pick this one here, the cable insulation might be measured good, but there is one weak spot that showed up only as very small, it's just a very small part in the whole cable, so it doesn't show up very clearly. If you had a lot of um, water trees here, they would add up and show well as an aged cable. But if there's just one little water tree, or let's say one bad water tree, on Delta will tell you overall your cable is healthy. And then you confirm with a VLF test, it blows up, your cable blows up, but then you know, okay, there was one weak spot, it's worth repairing it, because Tang Delta told me, in general, my cable is good, so I can continue using it. It's like um, you take your car to a garage and your mechanic says, overall, just takes a, an overall look at the, at the car and tells you, overall, your car is in good condition. Well, if you find that you have a bad tire on that car, it's worth exchanging the tire because the car in general is good. Different is when your mechanic tells you your car is in totally bad condition, windshield is cracked, one door fell off, um, it's running only on three cylinders, and there's no exhaust pipe anymore. And then you might say, why should I test and why should I test the tire? I'm going to throw away the whole car. I might take it to work tomorrow because it's still driving after that diagnostic measurement. But I know I need to exchange the whole car. That's it. that's the same point here. You need you you know um, if it's very urgent to exchange the whole cable or if it's if it can still run a little bit but um, it's going down. It's it's aging, so you have to think of exchanging the cable in the mid future somehow. Right. So that's what Tang Delta is doing. Tang Delta diagnosis. But like I said, Tang Delta is looking only at the cable, not at the terminations and joints. That is where the diagnostic measurement, partial discharge measurement is looking at that. And joints and terminations are the main source of cable failure. So that is a significant, important diagnostic measurement. So ideally is a combination of partial discharge, tongue delta, and then a VLF test. And then you have a really good overall consideration of your cable quality of the whole system actually. Then okay. Um, we will be talking about different voltage um, shapes that are available in the market. Actually, we have an instrument where you have all these voltage shapes in one instrument available because, and that's what this upper line here application is supposed to show, what is your preferred application for this voltage shape? Where is it best? Um, and you can do other measurements with the same voltage shape. If you say, for example, VLF sine wave is a relatively common, available, um, easy, I guess, least expensive way of, of VLF testing, and it can do everything. Well, yeah, nearly everything, but not as, as, as good as other um, voltage shapes. Um, Good. So let me just go through that. Um, ideally, well, you have, you have the voltage shape cosine rectangular VLF, very low frequency, which is 0 0.1 hertz. In, in our testing uh, field, VLF stands for 0 0.1 hertz. So one testing period, one testing period, negative and one positive, so one cycle is 10 seconds should say one cycle, not one period. The test for the test period is 30 minutes to one hour um, of this test. We will later see we can reduce that time if we monitor the whole thing with a diagnostic measurement. Other than that, if you don't do that, you should use this full one hour. People are complaining and say, oh, we cannot do the whole test for one hour, but you should. 
this was one of the main uh, uh, points um, in the previous um, uh, webinar, because in plastic cables, you have a process, these water trees that I mentioned. Water trees are a very slow growing process. And slow, I mean five to 15 years. When they are big and they become critical, we can convert them into electrical trees. That's a little bit arcing. And we will see this little bit of arcing is actually partial discharge. And we can uh, see that with partial discharge. But um, the, the, the voltage shape in, in general should be applied for one hour because these electrical trees, they need still uh, well, many minutes, up to 60 minutes to grow from becoming a bit critical to really a fault that you can locate and repair the cable. So you sh should wait for 60 minutes. And that's um, where we apply the cosine rectangular, ideally, because we have a cosine, a sine, cosine here in the, in the polarity change, which is nearly 50 Hertz actually, which is where I said, just said, uh, comes close to our 50 Hertz uh, frequency. Um, and then we have five seconds of DC voltage. And then we have a polarity change in a sine wave, the cosine. And then we have the DC voltage again. That's why it's called cosine rectangular. Keep in mind some instruments, the, the sine wave instruments, they have a button where you can change it to rectangular wave shape. That's not cosine rectangular. Cosine rectangular is actually using this a, a resonance of cable capacity and instrument inductivity to create the polarity change in milliseconds and um, in a nice cosine wave shape like in uh, op at operational voltage or operational um, uh, situation. We have a higher voltage here, but okay. So that's VLF cosine rectangular. That is a very nice method for VLF testing. It's recuperating energy of the test instrument. So the test instrument doesn't have to supply the full energy for every cycle. That's why the VLF can test longer cables. The VLF cosine rectangular, I must say. So that's best applied for very low frequency testing. You could also do very low frequency testing with a sine wave. Also here, one period is 10 seconds. It's very low frequency, 0.1 hertz. And it's a normal sine wave. That's relatively easy to generate. Um, so a standard sine wave. Um, in this case, the polarity change is very slow. It's 500 times slower than um, under 50 or 60 hertz um, um, mains, fre mains frequency, normal frequency. You can do a um, VLF test with it, 0 0.1 hertz, but keep in mind you only have two and a half seconds to charge all your cable capacity. And then you burn away for two and a half seconds, you burn away your, your voltage and it's lost. It cannot be recuperated. And then you recharge with negative polarity. Also, you only have two and a half seconds and then you burn away the energy. So you only have two and a half seconds to charge your whole cable capacity. And that is the limit of that testing method when we talk about testing. Um, because you can test only a shorter cable length with that. It's still several kilometers, but um, with cosine rectangular, you might as well do all three phases at the same time because the cable capacity allows you. The, the um, sine wave might have to test one after the other and then doing that for one hour. You can also do the partial discharge diagnostic measurement with that same voltage. Um, but like I said, the, the, the voltage gradient, the rise of voltage and the fall of voltage is much slower than with 50 Hertz. So it, 
the partial discharges do react differently sometimes. It's doable. It's not the best way, but it's doable. Um, but where we do need sine wave VLF is for tongue delta measurement. For the tongue delta diagnosis, we need to do it with the sine wave, and that's why it's there and it has its place in our um, on our list. Um, and then we will see during our diagnostic topic today, we have the damped AC duct, damped AC voltage. And it is a voltage, you basically you charge your cable to a peak voltage that you want to measure with. And then um, you get a frequency that is um, also somewhere near 50 hertz, it might be a bit higher, like 200 hertz or maximum, uh, we would say 500 hertz. Um, that is only 10 times higher frequency, so much closer to the 50 hertz as our other voltage, or as sine wave at least. So we apply a voltage of, um, let's say 200 hertz, for example, and during that um, frequency, we measure the partial discharge, display that, locate that. The nice thing of partial discharge is it's giving you a location. All these little dots here, these, these um, blue spikes here, they come up, um, they can be located. We will later see, I will, right now, this is just introduction, I will uh, go into all these details again. But um, we can locate that. The principle is kind of like reflectometer, TDR, reflectometer um, measurement that we know from cable fault location. Um, it's very closely related to that. Um, the duct damped AC voltage is, I would say, the perfect voltage shape for the partial discharge measurement. Frequency is near operating frequency. Voltages we can easily raise and lower and see what happens at higher voltages. Um, the whole measurement is done very quickly, gives you a lot of um, um, detailed information. You can easily measure inception voltage and extinction voltage. Those are two factor. At what voltage does the partial discharge start and where does it stop again? Um, and that's very easy to measure that with this voltage shape. So. Very good. Um, we also create a resonance between an inductivity in the instrument and our cable capacity, and that will create this resonance voltage. And that's why actually it is relatively easy to include all these three voltages in one instrument, because here we are using kind of a resonance circuit as well as we do that with cosine rectangular. So we have the same components actually. Um, and we just need to switch them in, in a different way. So I would almost say just a software thing if you generate one or the other. And sine wave is relatively easy to generate. We do have a DC source in these instruments anyway to generate any kind of voltage. So we might as well do a sine wave out of it and do the tongue delta measurement. But there are instruments around that do only one or the other method. Yeah, here we see the the um, overview again and, and the little bit of um, explanation. The sinusoidal or resonance that is there. There is the resonance, um, the um, 20 to 300 hertz. Typically, when you hear resonance voltage, you think of cable testing at higher voltage, high voltage cables, not medium voltage cables, but high voltage cables. Um, but actually relatively similar to that is the measurement for medium voltage also. Cosine rectangular is a combination of the resonant frequency, that's the polarity change, here we see it, at the 0 0.1 hertz, that means five seconds positive, five seconds negative. So we switch between positive and negative, um, and that way we don't get any charging effects in the cable. And then, like I said, the damped AC 
um, what do we have before? Um, MWT, monitored with stand test. That is something that I also want to mention in, in today's um, presentation um, is monitored with stand test. It is a test, a voltage test, and we monitor that, that with stand test, we monitor that with either tank delta, looking at the, what is the tank delta doing during our test, or looking at the partial discharge during our test. And that's what I mentioned before. Our test should last one hour. On paper cables, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, and, and uh, standards are um, um, slightly different, but in general, it's somewhere between 30 and, and 60 minutes. So it's a relatively long time where people do say, well, we don't want to wait that long. If you monitor your test with partial discharge, for example, and you do not see any partial discharge from the beginning of your test, well, then you can be pretty sure there are no electrical trees growing. So I do not have a bad effect started that I would need to finish. They haven't even started. Because these electrical trees are practically partial discharges. Um, and um, that way you can say, okay, I can I can stop my, my test earlier. Again, take the example with a car. You sit in the car, you're supposed to do the drive for for one hour full throttle to see if um, your tires blow up. Well, if you have a way of checking your tires as you're driving and you find they're not making any increasing noises, then you say, okay, everything's fine. You can stop your test earlier. Um, so that, that would be a, a monitored test. Let me just, um, I'm always mentioning here, um, uh, it's water trees, electrical trees. Um, in case you, you haven't uh, heard last um, April's uh, webinar, um, here's just a, a picture to, to give you an idea. This would be a plastic insulation cable. And here we have the water tree where humidity gets in, just the condensation is enough, and frequency and the water molecules with the polarity change of the cable. These water molecules are slowly chewing its way through the insulation. And this can take now 15 years or longer if they dry out in the meantime, uh, but they would grow for 15 years. And then they come to a point where the electric field stress at the tip is so high that they will convert into arcing. And this arcing here, this is the electrical tree, and that will burn through at operating voltage in one or two days at our test voltage in 60 minutes. We go with higher voltage, so they grow faster. And laboratory tests show 60 minutes is what they take. If um, in 60 minutes the, a, a water tree hasn't blown up, is because there was no, no water tree there. The water tree was maybe much smaller, not critical yet, so it didn't even convert into an electrical tree. This part here, this cloud, this electrical tree takes 60 minutes. But I'm talking about test now. Right? That was the VLF test topic. So I'm going back to our diagnostic topic here. Um, so this is basically always when, when we see this VLF here, VLF was called an entangular or sine wave. Um, that it was our test, and we can use that voltage to, on top of that, do a diagnostic measurement, partial discharge or tongue delta, or even the monitored withstand test. Um, okay. Now we will look at one after the other. Again, up to, up to now it was just a, a introduction to give you an overview where we are. And in the end, we might do that overview again, just to fit together all the little pieces 
um, that we talk about now. Yeah, and here we say the VLF sine wave does everything, but not as good as the others. You can do everything with sine wave, but you get better and more reliable results if you really use um, the appropriate, the, the, the best voltage shape. Again, when you take your car to a mechanic, and he's just an overall mechanic, he looks at the car in general, but if you can take your car to the me one mechanic that looks at the tires, one that looks at the chassis, and one that looks at the engine, that would be even better. Okay, let's start with a partial discharge measurement. Partial discharge measurement, I might consider that the most common, the most important measurement, because like I said, most of your problems occur in the joints and terminations. And I will show you some pictures in a moment of problems where they, they were detected. As this picture shows here at 100 meters, you see a concentration of discharges. Every little dot is one little, well, I, I cannot say flash over, but one little uh, arc of a partial discharge. It's not really a fault, it's just in one weak spot, some little sizzling. And um, every dot is, is one of these measured pulses, and then we can look at them, we can locate them. We found it is at 100 meters and there's a concentration, so that joint here has a problem. And now you can dig it up, repair it, and take the old one and look at it and see what caused this problem. How can we avoid that in the future? The instrument is, in, uh, is a nice and portable instrument um, with a control unit. A, here at the bottom is typically where it is the big inductivity to create the resonant um, circuit between cable capacity and um, and inductivity, instrument inductivity. And here we have the coupler, the voltage that we bring out and comes back always goes through that coupler and all these pulses that travel on your cable are uncoupled here, go through a little computer onto the laptop and are shown. So it's a very uh, simple way. Oh, by the way, yeah, new technologies for medium voltage cables. This technology is not really new anymore. I would say 10 years or so. Uh, it is uh, very easy to use in the field. Before that, it was also used in the field, but it was a little bit more like laboratory instruments. Technology is advancing. Um, so it is around also in the field already for I don't know, maybe 20 years or so. So it's not like a new um, uh, technology that needs to prove its existence, but it is a common known method. Here we see one set up for um, high voltage cables. Um, medium voltage cables, these instruments have a peak voltage of maybe um, 60 volts. So, and uh, here we see one that has a peak voltage of 200 kilovolts or 300 kilovolts. It is easily transportable in these flight cases. So, um, it can be set up within an hour. And uh, so it's still quite portable and easy to use in comparison to other methods. Very nice and gives you very good information of high voltage cables. The, the principle is identical, even the computer software is the same uh, software. So you just tell the, the, the computer which instrument you're connected to, so it knows for the operation, but the evaluation is identical. So why do we do the whole thing? Well, doing a commissioning or acceptance test with VLF or, well, 50 hertz or duck are not so common for acceptance tests. Like I said, that 50 hertz is not practical test in the field, but VLF would be one. As a commissioning test, well, you only see yes or no. Big workmanship problems will not be found because we will see now in the example, these problem spots, they do hold a lot of voltage. 
but they create partial discharge and that burns problems into the insulation and that might take a few months maybe a few years um, but you want to find them on time and repair them on time when you hear some squeaking noise on your car you want to repair it on time before it becomes a failure and you end up in the middle of the road you want to have it um, diagnosed and repaired sometime under controlled conditions and that's why partial discharge PD, partial discharge, is the common method for workmanship problems. You could do that. Uh, it's, it's a condition-based uh, um, diagnosis. So you, you, you see the condition of the cable. It's not a time-based where you say, my cable is 30 years old. I will exchange it. Whether it's good or bad, I don't know. I will just exchange it. Here you can... Uh, Diagnose the condition. Um, quality check of newly installed cable. Yes. So an acceptance test. Whether your company does your, your own joint or you have a contractor that you want to confirm uh, that he did a good job that lasts beyond the warranty period. Or whether you are a, 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 um, a um, contractor and you want to make sure when you pass your your cable to your customer your your job is finished you want to make sure it's good enough that you can actually grant a warranty of five years because you know your job was done well um, localization of weak spots preventive maintenance sure um, you reduce your outage times because um, you don't have the weak spots anymore that 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 you find by failure. You, you find them beforehand and you can fix them under controlled conditions, which again then is cheaper to do that than to wait until the cable fails and then rush out and, and in case uh, or in a state of emergency repair your cable. Right. Um, partial discharge. Um, the, the quality monitoring on newly installed um, cables. It's a, a, a check and a um, check of your contractors, basically the warranty, as I mentioned. Um, you can check or you can train your staff when, if you don't know what your problem is, you don't know how to fix it. So if you open up your bad joint and you look at it, you know what the problem is, then training can be much more uh, precise and, and better. And that increases reliability, sure. Blah, 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 blah. Now we go to some examples. Here you see, for example, the um, um, shrink joints. And um, for example, if, you're, if you're, um, uh, your cable trench is not big enough, it's very hard to do the, the heat shrinking in there to get with the flames. Um, to the to all the spots and do that well you might not reach under the cable and then you end up having some air bubbles here right and you might that might create partial discharge they are not supposed to be there you have access electric field and that's the point what what is a partial discharge is an excess of electric field a concentration of electric field in a small spot the isolation medium doesn't hold it anymore, and so you get in a very small flashover. Not the whole voltage, but just a very small flashover. We're talking about um, picocoulomb here, maybe one, one or or ten nanocoulomb in that in that range. But having that continuously over months, then here you see actually you see that there was something burning, fizzling in your cable, and it was detected on time. Here, this is a, a very nice example, um, the wrong size connector. If um, the, the uh, jointer goes out, uh, does a joint, and doesn't have the right size connector, you could either drive back two hours, get the right part, come back, and finish the job, or 
he might just say, well, I, I just take another connector. Um, electrically, it works. So here, a VLS test will test OK. It holds the voltage. But on these sharp edges here, you get high electric field and thereby sizzling, and that will slowly burn through the insulation, damage the insulation. Here, this uh, semiconductive tape was missing. And uh, you can see when you open it up, you can see here the tracks of the partial discharge already. Sooner or later, it would have failed. Because here was a very sharp edge. Here's the semiconductor and a very sharp edge here um, without field control. And that's where it was arcing. Um, joint body, not at the exact uh, size and wrong size crimps here, connectors. Um, this is an, a, a, from an old instrument, the display where you did see a lot of um, uh, little discharge dots and you had to evaluate them all individually by yourself. Now the software has gotten so good that it's doing the job for you and you can just look at it and confirm. Something like this should not be done uh, that creates partial discharge if you have to Keep in mind, you have very high electric field stress in the cable, and if that concentrates on some carbonized or even semiconductive part here or in some, some um, grooves here, then that's bad. Here also, you even see the, the partial discharges here already, how they were chewing on the insulation. Peeling tool was not adjusted very well. And so it, it was readjusted later, and you see all the grooves here. And of course, this is a very bad situation. The uh, vector was not positioned uh, in the center of the joint. Here you even see the, the field control elements, the semiconductive field control elements, how they're supposed to smoothly bleed off the electric field stress. And if that is not done correctly, of course, you have a bad situation where you have a concentration somewhere of electric field. Oh, yeah, and that's a funny one that happens um, when you do the shrinking and some insects crawl in there and dirt uh, that all can change the electric field and create damage. It's not supposed to be there. Joints and terminations are quite sensitive. Okay. Um, here we see the, the setup basically of, of the instrument, the same picture that we've seen before. I would um, go into this just to sh explain to you the damped AC. The damped AC is probably the, well, it's, it's a new topic for us today. We have talked about the cosine rectangular, VLS, sh voltage shape, and sine wave. There's not much to say about the si sine wave, that's quite, uh, normal, but um, uh, those were test voltages that were designed for cable testing, and we can use them also for doing our diagnostic measurements. Now, the third voltage, so cosine rectangular, sine wave, and the third one is the damped AC. That is, um, well, a bit more complex, but also uh, relatively simple. And it is designed for doing cable diagnostics. It turns out you can also do testing with it. Um, you could do 50 shots of damped AC voltage and consider that a cable test. Um, if you want to do that or not, I don't know. It's, it's, it's only a few milli, basically a few milliseconds of applied voltage to the cable it's over voltage it's better than nothing and you can use this on up to 300 kv so that's good um, and it's better than nothing but the main point is and what it's designed for is for partial discharge measurement and it's quite um, clever it's also using an inductivity in the instrument and your cable capacity those are the main components. You have your DC source, 
um, medium voltage 45 kV, 60 kV, or in the higher voltage is 200 or 300 kV. But this DC source here is charging up your cable. DC is going through that inductivity through the coil easily and just charges up your cable to your peak voltage that you want to uh, test. And doing one diagnostic measurement, you might do 20 um, of these measurements, but they only take charging seconds and measurement milliseconds. Right? So it's done very quickly. So you charge up your cable. After these three or four seconds, this switch here, okay, so you charge the voltage. After that, this switch here, an electronic switch will close. It closes. Now your, your DC source is out of the loop. It's, it's not, um, it has no supply anymore. And you create a resonant circuit between cable capacity and instrument inductivity. And this voltage goes always through that coupler. And there it is measured. Um, and you can see that the, shor the shorter your cable, the smaller your cable capacity is, the higher is the frequency. So the frequency does change with cable length. You have a long cable and you get very nicely low frequency. If you have a very short cable, the frequency goes higher. And I had a case where somebody said we have a 10 meter long cable. We want to measure that with partial discharge. Like I said, why do you measure a cable of 10 meters uh, so short um, with partial discharge? Well, it was a transformer connection cable and they wanted to measure that and that's okay. Um, but then the frequency is high. So what you do is you simply add or we add a, an, an additional partial discharge free capacitor with a higher capacity, higher capacity will lower the frequency. So that matter, you can test a one meter long cable if you want, um, and uh, the frequency won't go over 500. Hertz. And if you test a bit longer cables, uh, 100, 200, 300 meters, you already get frequencies of 300 hertz or lower. So the generation of this voltage is very simple. Just the DC source, that's very simple, and inductivity. Um, so very simple. Okay, here we go into the, the software. Softwares might look a little bit different, but just to give you a quick overview of how that how that works. Um, and let me have a quick look at the time. We still have an hour left, so that's uh, that should be good for a nice uh, overview. Um, so here we have the main software. First step would be you select your cable from a list. Well, that's just a few clicks, so that's in one minute, that's done very quickly. The second step would be your calibration. That's three minutes. So what you do is you just go with your calibrator. It's a, like uh, uh, just the size of a um, bit bigger uh, smartphone, maybe. Um, connect that. It injects um, calibrated pulses into the cable. The instrument measures that and takes that as a reference. So that's very, very uh, done very quickly. Then you start your measurement. You go in the measurement screen and the, the software opens one after the other. Um, here first the, the blue one and then the next one will be blue. So you can do that. So you can only do one after the other in the correct order. Um, measurement is maybe 15 minutes per phase. Um, you do. We will see that in a moment, but we will, we will see maybe 20 measurements per phase. Um, and like I said, those take seconds only. And in the end, you do an evaluation. And depending on if you just look at it, check a few pulses and say, yes, software is doing that correctly. I'm happy with it. You press the report button and it prints your PDF report. Or if you say no, I want to. I need to judge a bit more the pulses. Um, it might take a bit longer. You can have easy situations. You can have difficult situations. Again, if you take your car to the mechanic, the mechanic might have an easy job because your car is easily accessible. Everything and 
and small and simple car, or he might have a very hard job because there are a lot of problem spots and he needs to identify which sound, which squeaking noise belongs to which problem spot, right? Because you can have three bad joints on the on the same table and you will see all three bad joints. And then you have pulses that overlay and and run into each other and then you need to judge is this a reasonable pulse or should I rather ignore this because it's uh, not really identifiable. Software will do that very nicely, but there are always these cases where you say, well, a human body should have a look at that and confirm that it's okay. So these are, that's basically the procedure. So after all, getting your instrument there, hooking up in the substation and all these things, they take almost, uh, yeah, they probably take longer than the actual measurement. You could also, um, your very first step, your step number zero, um, adding new cables to your to your cable list. That is something you can do in the office. Uh, the, you don't have to do that in the field, but if you have tested a cable already, if your cable is already on the list, then you can uh, simply pick it out of the list, click on it, and start a new measurement. That's done very quickly. And that looks like this picture here, for example. You can actually add photos here if there's something, some specialty about this. Uh, location. Other than that, here we have our standard picture of the substation cable from here to there. Different cable materials, uh, different joints, different joint positions. These joint positions are not measured. They are entered by the operator, by the user. So if you don't know that there's a joint, it won't show up. But if somewhere along the line there shows up partial discharge and there's no joint marked, you could be pretty sure that there is a joint that you don't know of. Here we see a paper, uh, paper oil cable, um, an AKVA, and um, that is in a paper oil cable you could have partial discharge. A, an acceptable level all over, yes, but if there is a concentration somewhere, it makes me suspicious whether there's a joint or not. Imagine the oil ran out of the cable and you have the paper layers lying dry. You might get arcing between the paper layers. That's not good. You would see that. So if there is partial discharge, the instrument will see it. And then you judge how to continue. Here's the cable list. Um, the first step out of the list, you select um, the um, cable that you want to do a new measurement on. Second step is the calibration. You connect the calibrator. You see the pulses um, of 50 or 100 hertz. Uh, they, they send out uh, little pulses, get the level. You get an image which we will later use for the location as a, as a reference. So you have the level here, that's the highest pulse. That's the pulse that comes and goes right straight into the instrument, is measured immediately. And another pulse is traveling all the way to the end of the cable and coming back. That's this pulse. There. And so this is the traveling time. Traveling time, knowing the velocity of propagation, instrument knows now what distance that is or the other way around actually here's done the other way around e is image you have entered your cable length what your plan for example said your cable length and the instrument is calculating for you the velocity of propagation and then you also see the attenuation here that's also an important factor the the attenuation um and all of your reflections that you will later see will have to be on this um, curve here. Okay, so like I said, this is done in, in three minutes and um, that will be taken as your reference and you can later always look at that again. 
and here comes the measurement. We set our voltage in steps of, of in increments of uh, U naught, for example. We could also use peak voltage, but it turns out that most reasonable here we measure, for example, 0 0.7 times U naught with duck voltage. We apply duck voltage, we, the instrument has charged to this voltage here. Um, in, that was just over 10 kilovolts. Actually, it was 13.1 here, it says up here, it says 13.1 kV. The negative DC source has charged it to a peak voltage, to 13.1 kilovolt. Then this switch closed, and we got the resonant voltage here um, attenuating and dying away. So our first period, actually, we will later look at only our first period because that's the voltage we've set. What are these partial discharges doing? And while we apply the voltage, we will see discharges. And here we see, for example, the highest pulse. Let's look at the highest pulse. Actually, this is not one pulse, two corresponding pulses. One that came straight into the instrument to be measured, and one that went in the cable to the far end, was reflected and came back. That time difference, we can take the location, and we get here these dots. We have the blue. Um, blue is phase one, and um, we also do see at the same uh, spot some yellow dots, yellow squares. Um, that's phase two, and here we see partial discharges. We see our highest partial discharge, our highest blue triangle up here, is at the location of 102 meters. And it had one nanocoulomb. And we see whether well, a lot of discharges or only a few. So that's the information we get out of this. And here we, we see an, an image where you see the, uh, here are some more locations with something going on. And you could click onto every little dot here and see this, um, this PDR curve. And confirm yes, I trust this, or I say no, uh, I don't. And here you actually see you say thumbs up, yes, this is a pulse. Uh, we are looking actually at this one. That's the blue triangle here, and that's highlighted. We've clicked on that one, so this one is highlighted, and it's a bit bigger now. So, um, and we say yes, you you are a partial discharge, or we look at that and say well, only maybe. Then it is kind of shady. Or we say no, uh, software says you are one, but I say no, you're not a partial discharge. And then you can basically make it disappear. Make it disappear means it's still there. You can look at it again. If your colleague comes by tomorrow and you say, hey, let's look at that again, it's still there. So you can, if your colleague says yes, but um, this is one, you can do it. This is your evaluation. Here another screen, you can have different things you, you look at here. And, uh, and the whole process of your measurement would be you do, well, after your calibration, you do your first measurement, that's at zero kV. That's your noise level. You do a measurement and your coupler, this orange um, with the two tubes there, this coupler will detect everything that's there at zero kilowatt. You apply nothing. So everything that's coming into the instrument must be coming from ambient noise. You know noise level then, that's okay. Ambient noise, this noise level is actually, well, I would say 100 picocoulomb is normal. Keep in mind that for, for plastic cables, the maximum allowed picocoulomb of a plastic insulation cable is two or five picocoulombs. That can be measured in a Faraday cage at the cable manufacturer, but not in the field. In the field, you have 100 picocoulomb noise level, 100 or 200. Um, I would say this is kind of normal. Uh, so 
um, anything below that is disappear has disappeared. So you cannot measure down to a level of five picocoulomb in the field. But that's not necessary. If there's something going on in the cable, it has 500, 1000. You don't need to memorize these numbers now. We will see them in a, in a table in a moment also. There are some references that can be taken as reference. Okay, so very first measurement taken at zero kV, just to know what's going on in the ambient. Also, at this measurement, you would see if you have a source of disturbance somewhere, a radio antenna, uh, a rectifier nearby that gives you pulses. You would see that right away. You would see, uh, let's say here, if, you, if we look at, at, at a picture like this, our noise level, okay, here is, is, is very small, the, the blue line at, at the bottom, we have a scale now that's, that's much too high, but we would see that um, uh, higher, this is just the, the, the noise ground level. And if you would have um, a periodically appearing pulses here, actually we do have some, ah, that's good. See, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. They're very periodic. So there is a noise level somewhere, and they cause disturbance. We have to watch out that we don't confuse them with partial discharge. But we see right away there is actually a periodic noise going on, some rectifier. We can take that into consideration, but it's not that important. If it doesn't overlay all of our measurements, just knowing that it's there. Okay. Then we do maybe at 0 0.5 times U0, so um, half our operating voltage, and we do three to five measurements um, of that. But we don't see partial discharge, for example. We raise our voltage to 0 0.8 times face to ground, do a couple of measurements, and we don't see partial discharge. It would look like that. You raise your voltage here. So on this scale is, is your voltage. You charge your cable to more and more uh, voltage, 0 0.5 times, 0 0.8 times. But you do not see any of these partial discharges, hopefully. If you do, well, then we start locating. And then you go to one time face to ground voltage. This we would definitely record. We would save these values. We would save the zero and we would save the one. To later show our boss, hey, we here at zero, this is our ground noise level. See, we did have kind of a high ground noise level. So evaluation was a little bit more difficult. And so um, just to justify that or to confirm or to say, hey, we had very low ground noise level, so it was an easy um, job. You do measure at one time face to ground and you do save that one because that will appear in the final report and say at operating voltage, there's no partial discharge. Which doesn't have to be quite true, but we will see. First of all, we raise to that voltage, that's our operating voltage near our operating frequency and there's no partial discharge. Definitely that's good news. Then we raise a bit higher. We go again a bit higher, 1.5 times face to ground. Maybe we do see a little bit partial discharge going on here. We would save that for evaluation. We go higher to 1.7, also do here a few measurements. See maybe more, more partial discharge, save that, use that for evaluation. Ideally, you go up the whole ladder and you do not see partial discharge up to 1.7. You save that value to confirm and say, no partial discharge, cable is okay. That should be your preferred situation. You do at zero, do at one, you do at 1.7, and you see no partial discharge. Save all these three values, zero, one, and 1.7, and you're done. Your report will be very short. And that's the situation that you should have. You could go up to two times face to ground. 1.7 is kind of a, a magic number 
because if one faith falls to ground, the others could be risen to 1.7. And you want to make sure that even in that case, that might be standing there for minutes or longer, um, you want to make sure that even at 1.7, you don't start partial discharges. You don't do damage to your cable. And your joints and all these uh, joints and terminations, they should hold 1.7 while it stays to ground without partial discharge. Um, and if a contractor does the joints, um, you can say, hey, 1.7, and we did find a little bit partial discharge. Well, the uh, contractor might say, well, but that's only very little, that's not so important. Well, will you accept it or not? If you pick up a brand new Mercedes from your car dealer and it makes squeaking noises, you drive it back and say, hey, there's a squeaking noise. And if then the car dealer tells you, well, that's not so important, just turn off the radio and you won't hear it anymore. Well, that's not a satisfying answer because you say, this car is new, it shouldn't make squeaking noises because they get worse, and just after the warranty is over, you have failures, right? So, your cable should not have partial discharge up to this value. Some people go even to two times face to ground. Keep in mind, this is a non-destructive diagnostic measurement. You are applying um, near operating frequency, you're applying 1.7 times face to ground voltage. A cable, a cable has to hold this. A cable has to withstand that much voltage. Any, any switching surge or lightning surge or so is higher than that. So um, the cable has to hold that. If your cable would die during a diagnostic measurement, then it was so dead, you should be happy that it died right there and not in operation, right? That, uh, I have heard of maybe one or two cases where that happened. And if that was really the case, I don't know. But that practically will not happen. And like I say, if it does happen, if your cable failed during applying for some milliseconds that voltage, then your cable was so dead that you should be happy that it blew up. Okay. Um, now, if you go up, um, your your stairs here with your measurements, and you do get a first little bit of partial discharge at 1.5 times face to ground voltage. You would save that as a PDIV. Click on that button, it saves it as partial discharge inception voltage. That's the voltage where the partial discharge starts. Good information because um, you know it's are above operating voltage, so in general, nothing will happen. It's not good, but you can live with it for a while. Because in operation, you don't have partial discharge. Then you go to higher voltages and measure and see where it is actually. But then you also go lower and see the partial discharge extinction voltage. Where is that? So there's a hysteresis in this, which means Inception, so the starting voltage and the ending voltage are not always the same. So if you raise voltage to 1.5 and higher, it doesn't mean if you lower it, it ends at 1.5 also. It might actually need to go lower to 1.3 or so to extinguish. And then, then it's okay. If it starts at 1.5, no, that's acceptable. And if it goes down to 1.3, yes, then it's acceptable. Because if it goes back to operating voltage, then everything is fine again. So in operation, you don't have partial discharge. If you have a ground fault, you might have partial discharge for some minutes. If you have a lightning surge, you might have partial discharge for a few milliseconds. Right? But in operation, there's no partial discharge. So that's good news. It's not perfect, but it's good news. A problem is when your voltage starts, at, uh, your, your um, discharges start at 1.5, but your voltage needs to go down to 0 0.8 to actually extinguish again. 
That means any lightning surge will start your partial discharges because it goes higher. And when voltage goes back to normal, your partial discharge continues. And it ne your voltage never goes, goes down to 0 0.8. And we're not talking about sine wave, but we're talking about in, in RMS um, value there. So if it doesn't go further down, well, it has been started, ignited, and from there on, it keeps on burning. Let me see, I do have some, some pictures to that. This one here, for example, partial discharge inception voltage. That's your operating voltage, of course, sine wave, but uh, that doesn't matter in this case. So your voltage goes higher, starts, hits the inception, hits the inception level. So um, as we said in the example 1.5, so you, you do have partial discharge, and then your voltage goes down again, but it needs to go down further to be extinguished. Okay, and then it stops again. So you have partial discharge only during a few milliseconds, or if that was for ground fault, you, um, you might have that for minutes or so, but uh, for a period of time only. That's not good. You might want to monitor that, measure that in one year again, if it got worse or not, but, um, or in two years or so. Keep that in mind, but in general, um, at at shorthand, there's nothing, nothing bad. Other um, problem would be this one. Your voltage goes up to the inception voltage, goes back to normal, and never reaches the level of extinction voltage. That means it starts, you have inception, and it never stops again. And that is bad because then you should consider it as you have partial discharge always. You'll always have some kind of little switching or something that starts partial discharge, which means you permanently have partial discharge on the cable. In that matter, I would, well, try to repair that um, weak spot um, soon. Right? Weeks, months, maybe you were talking there, um, depending on how important the cable is and so, as I said. But this is, this is something um, I would consider critical. Even worse, of course, if the partial discharge inception, so if that red line is already below operating voltage, then it's really bad. So um, that was basically the whole measurement. And you will get a report that gives you an overview of all these numbers and tables that gives you graphs and um, where and how we locate that. Well, the easiest, let me start with this one. How do we locate that level? At the moment, we've been talking about, well, the partial discharge happening. We will see also a table how strong and what is acceptable and not. Um, but um, how do we locate these spots? Well, if you imagine you have a certain test object, a your cable on the test, here on the left side is where the instrument is connected, and we have a partial discharge near the beginning of your cable. Your, your pulse is happening and it's traveling both ways. And it is detected. When the first pulse goes through your, your coupler, your measurement device, it will be detected. And your reflected pulse, the one that goes to the other side, travels all the way to the far end. You see it getting smaller, it's attenuated, it's getting smaller and smaller, traveling. Bang, now it's detected also. So it's getting smaller and wider. Actually, this looks just like our calibration pulse from the pictures before. You have a first pulse that didn't travel very far. So it's sharp, narrow, sharp peak, um, slim, 
and it arrives very quickly, so it's still I. Where this, I call this the, the little brother, because they come from one family, they come from the same discharge, right? Um, that little brother had been traveling a long way, so it saw a lot of attenuation reflected, so it lost traveling through the cable, you lose the, all the high frequency, that's why it's uh, getting a small, wide little brother. And these two belong together. Of course, during applying your voltage for some milliseconds, you have you can have several pulses like that. Um, and uh, just with one rise of voltage, uh, one um, uh, rising sine wave, you get already many of these pulses. They will all be evaluated, and you get a good number of pulses that are easy to see and hopefully easy to evaluate. Um, now, you can imagine this a little bit. Imagine it's a canal of, of water, a, a um, concrete canal. Uh, you have a concrete wall on the left and on the right that's one meter wide, one meter deep. And you create or you throw a stone into that canal. Then you have waves, one big strong wave reaching the beginning right away, and one other big wave that's traveling all the way one kilometer long through your canal, getting reflected at the far end and coming back. And then your wave that's coming back is only very small um, and wide. Or the echo principle is basically the same with the echo principle, right? Now, consider if your um, partial discharge is coming from somewhere near the far end, what is happening is both pulses are traveling, little brother is already reflected, nothing is detected, bang, now. Now is when you can actually measure the first pulse. This first pulse, the big brother, has already traveled for a while. So it, it is wider, it has already lost high frequency, so it is wider than the other one, and wider than our calibration pulse also, if we want to consider that. And now comes the little brother, very soon after, also wide, and both brothers kind of still look the same, only a little bit attenuation, a little bit of difference between uh, width, pulse width, and a short time difference. That means the pulse is actually coming from the far end. Our big brother will already be lower because it has traveled and has been um, lost. So it's lower, which we don't know because we don't know what how, how high it was originally. So we don't care. What we do see is it's a wide pulse, so we do need do not need to look for a pulse somewhere back here. We need to look for a little brother that's closer. Big brother is wider. We look for a um, reflected pulse that's relatively near. When our original pulse is very slim, just like our calibration pulse, then we do not expect any reflection right away close here. We expect a reflection at the far end. And like I said, there's the attenuation curve. And here, if we, if we superimpose our um, calibration curve, we can see very clearly, does it look like the, the calibration curve? Then it came from the near end. Does it look like, uh, does it look different? Then it comes from the far end. Um, and we're not only seeing near end or far end, we're actually seeing the meters, how many meters and how many meters is the pulse. So that's the principle of how do we locate that. So we look at the pulse width, we look at the time difference between the two pulses, and we look at the attenuation. Are these two pulses on that attenuation curve that we expect from the um, from the, the calibration as a reference. Yeah, then we have different types. That's also in, in, interesting information of the um, 
partial discharges. And you see, partial discharge is really interesting. And I can tell you, it's fun. It gives you a lot of information. It's, I always say, it's like a big video game. Uh, and you very quickly get experience with these um, measurements because if you have measured five tables, then you already see, do they all look the same or is there one that looks very different? So it's um, quite quickly you will get some, some uh, experience there and uh, very good information, very important information um, that you can, if you can fix your table and where, or do you have to fix your table at all? And here is another extra information that you can get if, if you want. Um, you can see what kind of discharge is it. Is it a corona discharge? So in, in air, in, in gas, corona is, is a discharge in gas. Um, so typically in, in air in that case. Um, and uh, that would be, for example, that could happen on a dirty termination. Um, when it's sizzling outside on the on the dirt or humidity on that on the termination, um, but that's not so bad. You might have partial discharge of a certain level, and you find it's corona. Then you say, well, that's not so bad. Corona is not really eating up material; it's just in in air. You might have it on a surface that is. A bit worse because it's actually crawling on the surface. It's not really damaging very much. Or you can have partial discharge inside the insulation. That is bad because that is eating up material. And um, yeah, here are some some more examples. If you have a little um, metal chip there or air bubble, this, for example, would be the example with this uh, bad shrinking of a joint. Right. Or here, this example would be the one that we saw on the photograph um, where this mastic tape, this semiconductive tape was missing. So the semiconductive layer was just peeled off and left just cut there. And then you get a very high electric field stress here in the corner and you get arcing there. Like delamination, uh, that's like when paper layers run dry um, on the paper cables, for example. Right. And um, they have different phase angles. Um, they you you can you can look at the time when did they happen within that sine wave, and that would be just our first period. We just look at the part of the charges of our first first period, and we want to see what phase angle do they have. What do they look like? Did they come in the rising and falling, um, uh, in the rising, let's say in the rising uh, slope, positive rising or negative rising? Or did they happen pretty much at the peak? That was corona, right? And from that, we can, we can distinguish what kind of uh, discharge that was. Here are some other examples, how it could be um, displayed. This is called a phase resolved partial discharge. So you see the phase angle of the partial discharge gives you extra information. That gets already a little bit more scientific, but with some experience, you might get some interesting information. Um, it was also called a 3D pattern, 3D, three-dimensional, because you see the, the phase angle, you see the intensity as a second dimension, and you see the quantity as a third dimension. How many pulses are there? Because that's that's important to know. If you just have very few here, this blue blue is just very few partial discharges. Not so important. But if they become more yellow or more red, that means you had a lot of partial discharges in one location. Here you see how it's turning red, right? And this would be a bad partial discharge because it's in the insulation. And then it's eating up material. Which brings me to a point to say, what is a partial discharge? Actually, how, how does it 
But what is happening there? Um, if you imagine, it, here's just one example of the air bubble. Let's say there's an air bubble. Um, your cable has capacitances and voltage applied, whether it's your line voltage in operation or whether it's our measuring voltage, there's a line wave applied. All the capacitances will be charged and discharged. Also, your little spark gap, your little air bubble. And your, your air bubble is a spark gap. It has a capacity and it has a bridge, bridging gap. So as your voltage rises, all your capacitances will be charged. Also, this capacitance here. This capacitance will rise in voltage until the spark gap cannot hold it anymore and flashes over. It flashes, bridges that capacitance, to it discharges it to zero. When it's at zero, the flash extinguishes and it will be it will continue to charge again and flash over and charge and flash over and charge and flash over. So as you have one rising slope, several times the discharge can be charged and discharged, charged and discharged. So you get several arcings there in one rising slope. Um, if you have water in that gap, humidity or a wet joint or something, you won't see partial discharge because the water is basically bridging the spark gap and thereby your capacitor will never charge because it's uh, always short circuited. So water does not cause partial discharge. You might actually get partial discharge and high electric field around it because it changes your electric field. But in general, that is one thing to keep in mind. Water does not cause partial discharge. A total delta might see uh, humidity, a VLF might blow up um, the, the water, the humidity. And that's why there is always different, um, different methods. And the combination of all these methods is the best um, central measurement. So that's one example of how the partial discharges can work. Um, now also comes a very important point, how much partial discharge is acceptable? There is not really a standard for partial discharge. Um, Here's an example of a new one uh, from the Netherlands, a company that does a lot of partial discharge measurements, and they came up with an, well, uh, a reference where we could say, yes, we could take this as the reference. But like I say, operator has to judge if the cable important or not, and these things. Paper insulation can have up to 10,000 picocoulombs, and that is considered normal or it's acceptable, let's say, it's not normal, it's acceptable. Um, XLP insulation has less than 20, that's what I said, from, from production you have two or five picocoulomb that we could not even me measure in the field. If we measure 100 as the smallest number we can measure in the field, then you see 20 is disappearing in the noise level. I mean, the, the instrument can measure down to I think it's down to five picocoulomb or even lower, but in the field, we will never see that. We, uh, we can never uh, see that. Right? The instrument is good enough to do that, but uh, our field conditions don't allow that. Um, but one thing, looking at all these numbers in joints, how much is acceptable or not? Well, um, would I accept that? Not really. You can have a joint that has less than noise level, so practically no partial discharge. A joint, when it's done properly, has no partial discharge, up to 1.7 at least. If it does, that means something is going on. So I wouldn't really accept that in any case. Um, you might say, okay, 500 picocoulombs. If it's below 1,000 in general, I would say, 
Let me see. Right. If it goes above 1,000 picocoulombs, then you might say, well, we might consider that within the next year, double check, do a repeated measurement and, and see if it got worse or not, um, these things. But in general, you're supposed to have no partial discharge. Um, and yeah, if we if we just look at at um, some some screens here, like this, this one again, um, that's our evaluation screen where we can do the evaluation. That we can look at these these pulses, all these lines here. You can show them or hide them as you like. It shows concentration. Let's look at the the, the cloud of of red dots here at 600 meters. If somebody tells me there is no joint, um, then uh, I would I would doubt it and say, hey, I would imagine there is a joint, a joint. At least there is something going on. There's a paper cable, might be in the paper, but we see a level of just under 1,000 picocoulombs. But there is something going on that cannot be normal because right here in the blank. There's nothing going on. So it must be possible to have the cable clean of partial discharge. Why is there something here? So I don't go so much by the level, but first consideration is, is there a concentration of discharge? Then it means there's a problem. Second consideration is how high are they? I mean, if they go, 2,000, 3,000, that's not good. We see some that go to 20,000 where we say, hey, this, this is really bad. Right. But again, there, it's a little bit experience. And you might say, well, we know where it is. Um, we just let it run. And if it fails, we know pretty much right away which joint to exchange. If the cable is not so important and we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't want to do it, we don't. We keep in, we keep it in mind that it's there, and we leave it running. Or you say, well, if we cannot leave it running, uh, we have to provide a certain reliability of the network, and it's an important cable going to the airport, so um, we better fix it quickly. And you might even say that when when you see something below one thousand, you say, hey, there's the concentration. Let's do something about it. Now we would have to see here why are there so many? This is actually quite bad, many, many points. And I see it's a it's an NKBA cable, so yeah, it's probably a very bad cable with who knows either joints that we don't know of or oil leakages. Yeah, but this looks pretty bad, even though the levels are not so high, but it looks pretty bad. Okay, that was. Partial discharge diagnostics. Um, we could have a quick look at tongue delta diagnostics also as a comparison to see what that does. And um, yeah, the, the tongue delta diagnostics, we're at, at this position now. So we have just covered the red part here. Now we're looking at this blue at this tongue delta. And um, patient or the, the, the connection is very simple. There are all also uh, small portable instruments available. Um, and connection is very simple. Just connect the high voltage cables and they have the coupler inside with, uh, nowadays. So we do have a relatively easy setup. And uh, of course, test bands that have the, everything built in, or even the portable instruments, they are um, quite similar in connection. Partial discharge has an extra connection for the coupler that's here in between the high voltage line and the computer. But that is also not magic. So, um, partial discharge. Basically, uh, uh, sorry, uh, tongue delta is basically the uh, resistive leakage um, current 
um, that's not supposed to be there, and that is um, frequency depending. Uh, sorry, voltage depending. So we we change the voltage and uh, look at this um, resistance at different um, voltages. And here we um, we have to see if. Um, you would be applying the North American standard. There's basically there's an IEEE standard. Um, there's one for North America, and there's one for basically the rest of the world outside North America. Um, different countries apply the different standards. There's just one main difference. I will uh, come to that um, a, a bit more in detail. Uh, but the thing is. Um, we will be doing a certain um, number of measurements for a couple of minutes. It's relatively quickly, and we do that at 0 0.5 times face to ground at one time, 1 1.5 and 2 times face to ground, where the North American standard is doing that only at three voltage levels, and the rest of the world is doing that at four different uh, levels. So that's basically the, the, the rough um, background. The tongue delta measurement is influenced by temperature and number of, of joints also. So it's not enough to look at just the tongue delta value. We look at some more considerations. But basically, we have to keep in mind, um, we look at the cable overall. The overall um, quality of the cable. No matter if there are joints, how many joints there are, where they are, um, we don't consider those. We look at only the cable quality, cable material. And we get one number from that. Well, we actually get a few more numbers, but basically, um, here with this example, if you have a glass of water and you put one drop of hot water inside, the temperature is not going to change very much. The temperature of the glass of water is not going to change very much. So your tongue delta would still tell you your cable is good, even if there's one little or one big weak spot. If you put many small weak spots, hot water drops into the into the glass of water, it will give you a different temperature. It will give you a, di a different value. So you say, well, my value is not so good anymore. But if that is one bad or many small ones, you don't know yet. That's why it would make sense to, after the tongue delta value, do a VLF measurement, VLF cable test, very low frequency. Imagine you have a cable with one bad weak spot. It's a long cable, but it has one bad weak spot. Overall, the tongue delta will measure and find your cable is in very good condition. This one bad weak spot won't really show up in the overall average. So your tongue delta tells you your cable is good. Then you apply VLF test, and it will blow up that one weak spot, that one bad. Um, water tree, electrical tree, then in that case, um, it will blow up that one tree. And you know it's worth fixing it because, in general, your cable is good. Fix that cable, and you, you have a reliable cable. Um, if your tongue delta tells you your cable is in bad condition, better don't touch it with the VLF. Um, there were cases where people have applied VLF test on old cables, at that time not knowing they were all just guessing, yeah, they, they, they are old, okay, let's test our cables. Well, and, and all of them blew up. Of course, if you have a fleet of old cars and you all test drive them at full throttle, they're all going to break down. Sure. And what happens then is, the cable fails in one spot. The VLF test for one hour, and your worst tree blows up first. You stop the test, you cannot continue. 
So you stop your test, you repair your um, your cable, and then you have maybe 55 more minutes to test. It blew up after five minutes, so you have 55 minutes more to test. So you connect your VLS again, and after another five minutes, bang, the next tree blew up because you've been drawing 20 trees, but you don't know that. Um, so uh, the next one blows up, and you have to locate it, dig it up, repair it, go back and do another 50 minutes of VLS test. And the next one blows up, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And you cannot stop until you have fixed them all. Um, and still you're, um, uh, you don't know how many more will be coming. And you cannot just simply stop and say, oh, now I put uh, five new joints. Let's just stop with the VLS test and continue with the cable and exchange it next year. Because you don't know how many more trees VLS has been growing. VLF is not bad. Don't see this like VLF is bad. No. If you do regular tests, that is good to do. Um, every three years you do a VLF test, and the first three years nothing will happen, the next three years nothing will happen, the next nothing will happen, and then sometime after 25, 30 years, maybe you will have one uh, one failure doing the VLS, you repair that one, finish the one hour test, but everything is good, then the next three years everything will be good again, and, and next three years, and then Next time you might have one or maybe two faults in a cable um, during the VLS tests and so on. And sooner or later, the, these, these um, uh, faults will increase and these, these failures, the weak spots will blow up. And then you say, well, now we have too many. So uh, the life cycle of the cable uh, has been reached and we have to exchange the cable. OK, you might do it that way. But it would be easier. and. Mm, yeah, uh, avoiding so many joints, if you say, well, let's do a tongue delta measurement first. If tongue delta says good, we do a VLF test. If it blows up, we repair, cable is good. If tongue delta says bad, we don't even touch it with VLS because we know it's going to blow up left and right. Don't touch it with VLS, consider it for exchange. And that would be the, the process, the recommendation. How does that work? Well, tongue delta, we basically we apply three or four different voltage levels. You, you connect your test van or your test instrument. Um, the test is just taking a few minutes. You have to consider every um, cycle here is 10 seconds, 0 0.1 hertz. You shouldn't be using any other frequency. You could, but that's then out of the standard and you have to kind of get your own um, Experiences uh, best if you just follow the standard. And you have one, two, three, four, five measurements here in each level. Um, you can increase it to eight or to 10, it would make sense. Um, then you have a couple of periods more. Takes very few minutes longer. Um, not, not very bad. Um, so during each cycle, it measures the tongue delta. Then it raises the voltage. It measures the tongue delta again, raises the voltage. And then you get an average. Basically, you have here each little dot. That, let's take that green little dot. That dot is an average of our um, five measurements. Um, and that over the rising voltage. And hopefully, that stays a straight line. So this is what it looks like. This would be now the rest of the world um, standard, the IEEE for outside North America with the four levels. Um, here, um, the example shows 10 values. And then we have an average of these 10 values. That's the tau delta, and it is likely increasing, not very much. Now, we're not only looking, we're not only measuring one tongue delta. Well, we're not only measuring one tongue delta, we're measuring it here 
10 times, taking an average. That's one thing. Next thing is we're measuring it over four voltage levels. And the next thing is we're also looking, oh yeah, let me see the average, and then we're also looking at the stability, standard deviation. Here in the red part, the standard deviation shows us that it was pretty good. All of these points are not um, separating much from the, from the average value. And here, for example, in this grayish um, area, we see that the different uh, points are jumping very much. Or here in the green one, they're they are not jumping very much, but they're steadily increasing. So that's a bad sign. And like I said, the, the instrument is not only looking at the uh, simple um, Tang Delta value, but it's also looking at the Pip up, that is the difference between the Tang Delta at U0 and the Tang Delta at 2 U0. Using North American values, it's between 5 and 1.5. So that's the tip up. Is the Tang Delta increasing? Hopefully, it's not increasing. It stays very small, the Tang Delta. That would be good. So we are looking at the tank delta itself, at the average value, at the tip up, the increase, the delta tank delta. And we're looking at the standard deviation, these three factors. And now we're looking here at, okay, that's the one in North America going between, measuring between 0.5 and 1.5. Um, you're not, so we're looking at the, the average value, the mean value. Different difference of tang delta, so that's the, the tip up, delta tang delta, and the stability. If all of them are under a certain value, we say no action required. Well, the standard says no action required. If one of those is out of the range, then we say further studies advise, advise or if it's over a certain value, then action required. So this is kind of like a, a traffic light, green, yellow, red, where personally I would say a standard with this green, red, yellow, and red is nice to have, but this doesn't consider your experience you, or, you, or your, your knowledge of the cable, your history of the cable. How has it developed? Is it an important cable or not? That's something only you know, so be careful a bit with this kind of traffic light uh, uh, situation. Um, but after all, it's a very simple measurement. Um, it's quick. You just set your your U not voltage. You set how many voltage levels you want. So that means following the North American or the rest of world standard. And what material you have, what cable material you have. And then it looks into the, basically into the cable. And after all, the instrument will give you um, a green, yellow, or red answer. Here we have XLPE. Um, this would be the, the outside North America um, standard with the uh, up to two times U0. Um, but this is the IEEE 400.2 from 2013. Um, if you uh, want to follow, I, I suppose you, your company might have these standards anyway already av uh, available. You have to purchase them uh, and then um, you get the full, full standard. This is just an extract to show you uh, the, the way it, it, um, um, it works, but uh, for, the full, for the full standard, we cannot uh, uh, provide that. Um, but it, it has to be ordered from the IEEE. Right, but just so that you see the, the way it works, it is for paper insulated. Paper insulated has a much higher tang delta, factor 10 at least. Well, even more than factor 10. Right? And that is why you practically cannot diagnose with tang delta mixed cable sections. So if you have a mixed cable of plastic and paper, um, then uh, 
Tang Delta is not so applicable if you have a long um, paper section with up to 20% um, XLTE or plastic, other plastic, then, then it, it would be okay. Because the, you only look at the paper because that's dominant in that matter. On the other hand, you cannot do it the other way around, doing a long um, XLTE section with some paper in it. Because the paper, like I say, is so dominant that you don't know, is it a bad paper section? Or, well, is it, I have to say, is it a good paper, short paper, paper section? Or is it something bad in the plastic? Um, little recommendation, if you have that case, if you happen to have any uh, uh, work on the cable, fault or something, and you cut the cable anyway, go there, do a tang delta measurement, measure left, measure right, maybe you can narrow it down that way to say, okay, from that point, one direction we have only plastic, okay, measure it that way, and then you can at least see that section is good. Um, here we have an, an example where one phase is out of range, the others are good, this is an indication that you actually have a problem in one phase in a um, um, in a joint or so. Check that with VLF or, or partial discharge. That could be that your cable is actually healthy, but you have a big partial discharge somewhere, a big partial discharge source. Partial discharge will distract your tongue delta. But since this happens only in one phase, you know right away this has nothing to do with your cable. All three phases age the same way. If one phase comes out of range, then it's not an aging problem, then you have a partial discharge problem somewhere. So there are some, some nice, good um, informations about, uh, about the whole thing. I hope I could give you a little bit of um, information, um, what we might sooner or later uh, also talk about. Right now, we've talked about basically partial discharge. We talked about location, TDR. That is, um, well, it's a pre-location. It works like a TDR, right? If we um, have a nice image here. Here, an image where we say 600 meters, where are these 600 meters? Where is that? There's supposed to be a joint, and it turns out, well, 600 meters, that's right under a big traffic intersection. Um, 600 meters, with what precision? And with what precision can I measure that? Right? Uh, I cannot dig such a, such a big trench. There is a little trick. You can use an instrument. That's the, the, the PD lock. And uh, it's basically a TDR, and you artificially inject a pulse into, at least into plastic cables, you can do that. You inject the pulse at a reference location. Um, if we look at that, uh, let's see here we have, oops, sorry, wrong click. Um, this is the one I wanted. This is basically how it works, right? You connect a TDR at the beginning and somewhere where it's accessible. I mean, you have to dig a trench somewhere, but you don't have to cut the cable. You don't have to stop traffic and go to the big um, hassle. You can connect that pulse generator around the cable and it injects pulses. And with the TDR, you can measure it, locate that one, and then find out, well, actually, we thought the PD was supposed to be in in one place under the street, it turns out we're even too far, it's on the other end, right? So that way you can narrow it down. It's a little bit extra work, but at least it's doable. But you can imagine Pico Coulomb, you cannot measure from the top of the ground, right? When the cable is in the ground uh, and inside a shielded cable, that's not possible. Okay, that's just um, to give you a very quick overview. Well, two hours is kind of, um, quick, uh, and um, no, I, I want to go. Um, 
overview and I would basically end the presentation for the moment. Hope for some interesting questions and um, hope to be able to give you some answers. If not all answers can be given now, then uh, feel free to contact us, your local um, mega representative um, um, or us here in, in, in Germany, um, and we will answer your questions, help you with your instruments. Uh, we can do trainings, maybe video trainings, any of these things. You see, this is a very interesting, big field of operation. We want to help you to be able to use your instruments best way possible, take most advantage out of it. Only when you're happy with the instruments, then we are happy. If you do not have instruments yet and you need to address problems, uh, we're happy to discuss that with you more in detail and say and see what is most important for you, um, what makes most sense to apply, what to start with, and how can we continue, what should be the first steps, all these things. Now, um, I would I see, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. I just see I'm not sharing my screen, but um, uh, let, let us know um, how we can help you. And I would pass the word back on to, uh, to uh, Sanjay and see if there are questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bernard, uh, for the presentation. Uh, so we have some of the questions in the Q and A session in the Q and A chat window. If you can see, uh, or not, there are some questions uh, asked okay. by the participants. Now let me see how I find that uh, in the chat. Right, that is in the chat. Mm, not in the chat. In the Q and A window, you might you may find the questions. In the ah, okay. Uh, there was a ah, yeah. uh, an good question in the chat window you can start with. Okay, now I think I got that one. Okay, the, um, Mohammed, which which one do you say? Which one is the, um, the uh, nicest before I read all of them? Yeah, can uh, it, it is in the chat window. Can the BD diagnostic system replace the IEC recommended procedure for testing? in particular the hv test for one hour or uh, for the newly installed cables or it should be a complementary only um it could replace well um it could shorten the duration um if you imagine um if you do a voltage withstand diagnostic you could reduce the time Imagine you do, according to the standard, the VLF test. That's supposed to be one hour. Let me just um, flip. When I when I flip here, I lose all my overview. So I just go page by page. You see, there's a lot of information, um, and I'm I want to go to the um, VLF section and look at this this picture this is the the aging process of a plastic insulation cable and the reason why you do vlf very low frequency measurement you want to um blow up the bad water piece not the little ones i can here go into the um looking at only the ones that go one way to make it a bit more clear and open the whole um, animation here and see um this one here is um, um, it's already converting into, into an electrical tree in operation. That blue circle here, that's like the limit line. If we increase with VLF, we put more voltage stress on these um, water trees, and we would even this one here convert this into an electrical tree because the electric field stress is now too high because we increase our voltage. And here we would have an electric tree growing. Now, 
if we do just the VLS test, we would have to run this for one hour, because if this was the only water tree we had, it would take one hour basically from the red line all the way in to the conductor to flash over. There's a, a um, um, reference, a, um, a table that, that says how, how fast these uh, trees grow at what voltage level, so that would be 60 minutes. Now, if you do this monitored withstand diagnostic, MVT monitored withstand diagnostic, you do a VLF test, and at the same time, you simply connect the coupler and watch what partial discharge is doing. And you would see, oh, there's partial discharge. After maybe, maybe one minute, there's partial discharge setting in. Oh, so I have an electric tree. And then you could stop right away that measurement and say, oh, I have an electric tree at 325 meters, you would already have a pre-location, right? That would be right after one or two minutes. Um, and you could stop the, the, the test and say, okay, I can operate this now for a few more weeks, but we have to fix this quickly, knowing that our test has already damaged the cable further, right? And has been growing the electric tree. But we saw that early, so we could stop, Okay, most people would probably say, you know what, let's just finish that hour blown up. We know where it is, we have the pre-location, we are right here um, in the middle of the week, so we, we can easily fix it, it's out of service anyway, we can fix it, and then we're fine. That's good. And actually, you would even see if there are two or three points, because you would see that as, as, separate, um, as separate spots, so another advantage. That I've never really thought about, but yeah, good. Um, on the other hand, I mean, this is if you do find partial discharge, then stop your, uh, uh, then you know you have a problem and you stop your test or you continue. On the other hand, and that's probably more interesting, you do a VLF test, and after like within the first five minutes, you say, we do not see partial discharge. That means we do not, we did not start any electric trees, which means we do not have any water trees. So you can stop your, your test after five minutes or maybe let it run 10 minutes to be on the safe side. But whatever hasn't started right away won't start. So there was nothing, there was no water tree. These are processes that start immediately and then grow their way slowly all the way through over that one hour. You do not have water trees that convert into an electrical tree after half an hour. They either convert right away or they are too small and then nothing happens. So to answer your question quickly, can, um, can we reduce testing time? If we do a monitored test, yes, you can. Because either you see right away, I do have a problem, and then you don't care about some more minutes or not, or you see right away, I do not have a problem, and I won't have one during my future testing period either. So you can stop it very soon. Okay. Um, I will read through the questions. Um, Mohammed, if you see something quickly where you say, hey, that's very interesting to answer that quickly before we lose too much time, then go ahead and let me know and I will see. Is there any limitation of power cable length for use of this equipment? I think um, ah, good, yes, good question. Um, I see next session we have to make three hours long. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. Only. Um, but yeah, there, there are always a good, uh, a lot of good, uh, important questions. Is there a length limit? Um, yes. Um, BLS test cable test limitation is what's the cable length, the capacity? How much capacity can my instrument charge in a certain amount of time? Um, and that will be 
like this cosine rectangular that would be the most powerful on a medium voltage cable is um, approximately 25 kilometers. Well, it depends. Look at your cable capacity and look at the, 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 the manual or the, the leaflet, how much it can test. Um, cosine rectangular can sometimes test up to five microfarads because it can reuse the energy. That's why it's very powerful. Five microfarads. Medium voltage cable rule of thumb, you could say, has um, two microfarads per kilo, uh, 0 0.2 microfarads per kilometer. So that's um, 25 kilometers in that case for plastic cable. And it has 0 0.3 microfarads per kilometer for paper cable. Paper cable has less. Uh, Paper cable has more capacity, so you can test less length and about one third. So, um, a, a good number of kilometers you can test with VLS. Talking about partial discharge, what's the maximum length? Well, it is limited by the cable attenuation. The charge the cable. Um, the, the cable can be very long. It's charged with DC voltage. In worst case, it just takes a bit longer, right? Um, it, it can take, I would say, typically it's like four or five seconds, but let it take 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Uh, that, that would be okay. That's not the problem. The problem is the pulses that travel. Do I really see them when they travel so long? Um, they are attenuated, and we're talking about picocoulomb pulses, and they're attenuated. So, that, that was the long answer. The short answer is very, very roughly, we say like four, five, six kilometers, but we have been on cables that were 14 kilometers long, and we have had good results. You might be on a cable of three kilometers, and you don't see the cable end. You see that during calibration. If you don't don't see your cable end, you have a problem. But uh, I know from cases, fourteen kilometer long cables, and they have been good cable ends, good results there. Um, you see, there's a very wide span, um, and we cannot really say a number because it depends on the situation, attenuation mainly in that case. So. Um, Several kilometers with partial discharge. Tang delta. What's the length limit with Tang delta? Well, that is limited again with the with the cable capacitance. Tang delta is based on VLS sine wave. Sine wave has two and a half seconds to charge your cable and two and a half seconds to discharge again. So, whatever this instrument can charge in two and a half seconds, that's your and that would be also somewhere within the range of maybe five, maybe 10 kilometers, roughly, very roughly, right? But in, somewhere in that range. Um, like I say, 0 0.2 microfarads per kilometer is plastic cable, 0 0.3 microfarads per kilometer is paper cable. Just rule of thumb, look into your manufacturer of data. Sheet and will tell. Um, and look at our data sheet depending on which instrument you're using, different capacities that you can test. But roughly a, a, a bunch number of kilometers that you can test. Okay. Um, I think. Uh... We have one more question here. Uh, it's partial discharge test is applicable for from which voltage level? Low, medium, high voltage? And partial discharge is, is measured. Um, it started out with medium voltage. And yep. uh, we have instruments available up to 300 kilovolts. So you can do that also in the high voltage, um, maybe 220 kV cable range. 
um, that, that would work. Low voltage, no. For low voltage, partial discharge is not uh, an issue. Tangelta is not an issue. BNF is not an issue. So we're talking about medium voltage, I would say 6 kV and higher. Do see one question here, uh, Doug? Do you mean DC? No, Doug is yep. damped AC voltage, so I guess that's uh, Mohammed answered that damped AC voltage. So here, uh, another question: Can can we conclude that the PD diagnostic is more than enough to verify the healthness of the cable before commissioning? Um, no, not not really. It's the I would say it's the best method to use, so I would definitely do that. Definitely recommendable. The only, not really, if you say commissioning, imagine for commissioning, you might also want to do a sheet test, something completely different that we haven't even mentioned here. Um, but a sheet test is for commissioning. Well, it could be considered an important test. So. Ideally, you do a, um, a VLF test. Well, I, I would say first of all a partial discharge test because that's uh, that's a diagnostic. I must say partial discharge diagnostic. It's not damaging. Um, if you see partial discharge, you already know there you have to fix some problems. Then you might do a tan delta measurement. Just to make sure you don't have water treating. If it is an H cable, if it's a new cable, um, you might not need to do tongue delta because um, a new cable cannot have water treat. Right. Then you might do a VLF test. So first the partial discharge, then on old cables, tongue delta, on new cables, just the VLF test, just to make sure your joint. If there's water or some other damage that doesn't cause partial discharge, then you want to do a VLF test. And the, the last one um, would be a sheet test, just to make sure your outer jacket is not damaged uh, and not in the future water will come in. So it's like going to the doctor. When you go to the doctor and say, hey, doctor, am I healthy? Um, you say, okay, let me see your lungs, let me see your heart. And then you're happy and you go home and you're happy. Best would be if the doctor also checks for uh, whatever, for your skin, for your uh, bones and whatever, right? So there are some measurements and that would definitely be, first of all, um, partial discharge and maybe sheet test. Um, also the left test and the, the good thing is sheet test i mentioned that the sheet test sheet test is just a dc test right up to 5 kv maybe up to 10 kv on high voltage cables or so uh, in all these instruments they have dc sources inside anyway so they provide that method as a byproduct anyway right? so that's not an important thing but partial discharge is the most important the key one i would say not really the only one. I mean, before you, if you say, well, you you want to invest only in, into, not into the full big thing, then definitely partial discharge would be the first on the wish list. Yes. Um, what's the next one? Um, I see one question here. Um, what's best for um, cable life uh, the test, the AC or DC on XRP or uh, paper cables? Um, okay, that that goes a little bit into already the, the previous webinar. I think you can even watch the previous webinars, right? You, you can go onto the mega website on webinars. First, it lists the, the the coming the upcoming webinars where you can register and participate but it also lists a long list of the last two years of webinars where you can look at um, all webinars that we've held 
And there's also the the webinar with the um, um, with, with testing topic. I did have problems entering that one recently, but but uh, it, it is available. But um, XLPE cables are not or plastic insulated cables are not tested with DC voltage. You might create space charges if there are weak spots inside you charge up the insulation you charge up that weak spot isolate that you won't find it and you will create more problems when you re-energize that's the, the very short version to say plastic insulated cables should not be tested with dc it's not in the standards anymore either it's already gone from the standards the ieee or the the um, en uh, I see uh, standards. They all took the DC test away from the from the XLPE. Um, paper cables, you could do DC test. You don't have that effect. But if you have VLF anyway, you can do VLF for everything. Um, well, somebody is asking for the recorded webinar and the presentation yes we will send all of this to everybody yes i can i can put a uh, um, small pdf together and and share the um, the, the slides and um, i have to see just the, the the main most important ones i'll put together the webinar will be as i mentioned will be um, accessible anyway as well All right, we can, do we want to answer more questions or do we want to just see, um, yeah, most of them asked for the, the PowerPoint, right? Um, and if we find any more questions to answer, we can do that by email or feel free okay. to contact us, right? I think, yes, uh, we are done here, Gernot. Thanks a lot for your Nice webinar. Well, it was a pleasure as always. Always happy to uh, share information and get some feedback also. And Jay, the ground is for you. Yeah, so you want to uh, answer the uh, questions from the QA section too, or? It's already done most okay. of the questions. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, everyone for attending the session today. And thank you, Gernot, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, the recording will be sent to you in uh, within a week to all the participants and also the presentation. So thank you once again. Do follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn and also uh, register for the upcoming webinars. Thank you very much and have a nice day thank you thanks everyone bye bye